In this video tutorial, we would like to show you on how we separate heavy minerals in the Institute of Geosciences at Heidelberg University. This method involves four different steps. The first step is crushing the rock. The second step is sieving the material. The third step is density separation using water. And the fourth and last step is mineral picking with the help of a binocular microscope. In this video, I will show you in detail on how to do each of these steps. Before we jump into the different steps, let's talk about the tools we need for this method. We need a hammer, plastic bags, eye protectors, a sieve, usually of 200 microns, beakers, in this case, we're using a one liter beaker and a much smaller beaker. We need a container, a spoon, a brush, and we need a stick to stir. And also we need uh, bowls, two different bowls. Be careful on trying to get bowls that are curved at the bottom and not flat. If you only have flat bottom bowls, the process of separation won't work very well. We also need a petri dish and we need a bottle of water that you can squeeze. And of course, we need a marker. Okay, one of the most asked questions is uh, how much sample should I use for mineral separation? Well, this depends on the mineral you're targeting to separate. If the mineral that you want to separate is very obvious in a hand specimen sample or in the thin sections, then probably you don't need too much material. Then it would be enough with some pieces of the rock but in the case that the, the mineral you're targeting is not obvious, even in thin sections, then probably you will need much more materials, maybe up to kilograms of this type of materials. This method is really useful when the mineral you're trying to separate is expected to be there, like zircon in rhyolite, but it's not very useful for samples where the minerals are probably very low in uh, abundance, like zircon in andesites. So I would recommend to use this method for that case, and I would suggest that uh, for that type of samples, use like a willful table or something where you can process much more sample. For rocks with a lot of vesicles, it's truly important to wash to wash it with the brush and water and even with the ultrasound because all the material could go into these holes. So we'll go and wash this piece now. Once you have cleaned all the different pieces, we can also put them into the ultrasound. For that, we need the beaker, we just put it inside the beaker and we add some water and we bring it to the ultrasound. Now we put the samples with the beaker inside the ultrasound that also contains water. We can leave the sample inside the ultrasound for around 5 to 10 minutes. Even that the rock pieces were brushed before the ultrasound, 
we can see that there was still a lot of remnant dirt in the samples. So this is why ultrasound is very useful. Once the sample is perfectly clean, we take the rock pieces and put it into a drying bowl. Then we can take the pieces to an oven to dry them. Something to take into account when bringing the samples into the oven is the oven temperature. Depending on what method you are planning to use or to apply to your minerals, the temperature could be quite important. For instance, if you are planning to do uranium thorium helium dating in circons, then the oven shouldn't be above 50 degrees. If you are planning to do uranium lead analysis or uranium thorium analysis, of circons too, then the temperature doesn't matter too much. You can have high temperatures and it won't matter. So take into account this before you place the samples into the oven. You can leave them overnight, which is more efficient for drying pumice samples or samples with uh, a lot of vesicles. After cleaning and drying the samples in the oven, we can start now with the first step of the separation process, which is crushing. One of the most common methods to crush the rocks is using a jaw crusher. However, this becomes a little bit problematic because jaw crushers are very difficult to clean because there's no way to clean all the different parts that comprise the jaw crusher. We can always have high possibility of contamination. Because of this, we, also, we always prefer to use just a hammer and bags. Even that we are only using a hammer and a bag, we also want to avoid any type of contamination. So I would suggest always to cover all the surfaces you are planning to use for the crushing. In this case, I'm using a paper towel and also a bag on top of a metal plate. Now, to crush the sample, we place the rock pieces inside a plastic bag. These are usually very thick plastic bags and we always fold the bags like this. Just to avoid having any pieces of the sample flying around when you're hammering. Once you have done this, you can start, you can start hammering, not before wearing your eye protectors. In this case, as you can see, this rock was very soft because it was a pumice and we needed only a very small hammer. But in some cases, you can have very hard rocks, like metamorphic rocks or plutonic rocks, with a lot of quartz. Then you can use a bigger hammer, but be careful. So the idea when crushing with the hammer is to have a, a fine powder. This way we can avoid also the mill, which can be uh, another potential source of contamination. Okay, once we have the powder ready, we need to transfer it to the sieve. For that, very carefully. Grab the back. And you can see now we have our powder in the sea. So now we can see the sample. As you can see, we still have some remnant that is larger than 200 microns. So what we can do if we need more powder below 200 microns is just to take this sample again into a bag and hammer it much more and then you bring it back and you sieve it again.
And you can do that as many times as you wish until you have enough material that is less than 200 microns. Let's see what we have now. Okay. So this would be all the grains that are smaller than 200 microns. Okay, now it's time to put the powder into the beaker. For that, we can use the spoon. As you can see, we have very little material in our case. In this case, this sample is a rhyolite, it's a high silica a sample, so most likely it will have a lot of circum, so we don't need too much sample for this type of, of frogs. So now that the sample is inside the beaker, we have to add the water. And we will start the process of decanting the sample, so this means that all the heavy minerals will settle down in the bottle of the beaker and all the light minerals will start floating in the water. We can use the stirring stick. So you wait a couple of seconds. You can start looking some minerals floating and some others going down. So now it's a good time to start separating the light minerals. For that we use another container. So now we have a concentration of heavy minerals here and light material in this container, including mineral, glass. What we need to do now is to repeat the process until the water becomes quite clear. You can see now that the water is much clearer than before and after repeating this process for three or four times you will have quite clear water and that's a good sign that the light material is not more in the beaker. As the process continues, you will start looking at your sample much more darker than before. This is because we are concentrating all the iron magnesium rich minerals, all the oxide, titanium iron oxide minerals, and including silicon, of course. You see there's very dark material now. So this is how it looks after three uh, steps of washing the sample. You see the water is quite clear, we have very little material inside, we still have some light material. This uh, is not probably possible to take it out from in this step, but we'll do it in the next step. Okay, so now we need to use the drying bowl. And we will transfer our sample into the drying bowl using the water bottle. We need to make sure that we are transferring all the grains. So make sure to clean very carefully the beaker with the water stream coming out of the bottle. Now it's clean and we have now our concentrate 
in the bottom of the bowl and you see that there is a lot of dark minerals and that, that's always a good sign. Okay, now we have the sample here in the, in the grinding bowl and we looked at the, all the heavy minerals, the dark ones are above and we still see that there's a lot of light material that in this case looks like white. Okay, so now we'll try to separate these two different uh, density materials with a kind of a shaking technique that I will explain in detail now. It's very easy to see how the two different uh, density materials behave in the water. So when you shake the bowl, you will see that all the light material behaved very differently, so it moves much faster than the dark material. You can see here it's moving around while the dark material is always sitting down. So we will take advantage of that. And now, what we are planning to do is to try to leave the heavy material always behind. This means that we have to move the ball in certain way, in the same direction always, trying to leave a trace of heavy minerals behind. So the water will move to one side and the heavy minerals will stay in the opposite side. So let me show you what I mean. You can make small circles You see that there is a dark a trace of minerals here and that's what we want to collect later. Now we are bringing all the white and light materials to the front and it's coming together with the water. Be careful because at some point the water will start collecting the heavy minerals that you left behind at the beginning. So that's the point when you need to stop and then you need to take out the light materials into your beaker. So this is a good moment where you can stop, you can use your water bottle and you can squeeze it and bring the light material back into the beaker. Now we have a concentration of heavy minerals that we need to collect. And for that we also use the water. And you can see clearly now that this is a very dark concentrate, which means that you most likely have magnetites and ilmenites, and that's a good sign because circons behave very similarly to these two different phases because they have more or less the same density. So this is always a good proxy if you want to know where the circon is or any heavy other mineral, garnet, monocyte, rutile. We can transfer the heavy concentrate into a small beaker and this small beaker we'll use it later to take it to the microscope or just to transfer these minerals into a smaller petri dish. So very carefully try to, to gather all the heavy minerals from the bowl. Just keep the streaming water because sometimes uh, there are no dark minerals but Sergon is transparent or monocyte is transparent so it may be still there so we want to be very sure that we don't leave anything behind. Okay, all the heavy minerals are here. We have the heavy minerals and we have some extra water so we can we can take the extra water out very carefully. So you see heavy minerals are very difficult to move, so they are still here. So throwing the water away is not a very big problem. Now, 
We can give it another try for the light material because sometimes we need some circles and circles move also with the light material. So I would do it two or three times. Yes, to make sure that you have all your heavy minerals separated. In fact, if you look at the ball again, you can still see very uh, a lot of dark materials or minerals. So let's try it again. You can collect everything in the middle. In this case, uh, if it's moving too much, it be because of uh, too much water. So we can throw a little bit of water out. And we repeat the process again. You see there's a lot of dark materials and minerals there. So we want them to separate from the light material. You see, all these are heavy minerals and these are most likely uh, feldspar, glass, quartz. Okay, so you see the water, it's arriving again. This is the moment to stop. Let's use the water again. Let's collect the heavy minerals. So you see, there were quite a lot still here. So we need to do this or repeat this process, I would say at least three times, just to make sure that we're getting everything. So, one thing that I would highly suggest is that if you take your sample to the microscope and you don't find any circles or any garnets or any females you were, that you were targeting, then to look on the light material that you have here. Always have a double check on this material. So you do the same process, you trim it a little bit more and you transfer this material into the white hole and try to separate the heavy minerals from there. It happens that somehow, sometimes, maybe because you put too much, too much water, you stir the, the water with the sample too much, or could be many different things that you can transfer by mistake your, all your heavy minerals, or most of your heavy minerals, into the light part of the separation. So just as a double, double check and always with a lot of caution, keep the light material. So to look for the minerals in the binocular microscope, we usually use Petri dishes. So I will suggest that uh, to transfer the sample here in the lab already, just to avoid any accidents in the microscope lab. So in this case I'm just washing all the heavy minerals from the small beaker and now they are all inside the petri dish. Okay, we have a, a lid and this is a good moment to write the name of your sample. Okay? So once we have finished in the crushing lab, we can go now to the binocular microscope to do the hand picking of the minerals. For the hand picking of the minerals, we need a different set of tools. In this case, we can use a metal needle, we can use a whiskers of a cat or a well pick in a stick, and a pipette with a new tip. And also we can use some ethanol just to put it in the tip of the metal needle in case that the minerals are sticking to it. The binocular microscope can have different light settings. This means that you can have light coming from the bottom or light coming from above.
Which one you will use, it depends a lot on your preference, on how you have been trained in the past. In our case, we usually use light from the bottom, also using a polarizing glass. So before looking at the concentrate of heavy minerals in the binocular microscope, what we usually do is we shake the sample inside the petri dish, of course with water, in circles, just to gather all the minerals in the center of the petri dish and also to create some separation of the heavy and the light minerals inside the petri dish. So once you do that you will see that all the heavy minerals will stay around the entire populations of grains. You see they are all the dark minerals all around. I will highly recommend to start looking for your target minerals in all the darker areas of your sample. This means that the areas that are enriched with magnetites and ilmenites or any oxide that is dark. In this specific sample we are looking for zircons, so I will proceed to look for them. So now we can start looking for zircons. Some of the characteristics of zircon crystals under the microscope is that they show a high relief, which is uh, usually reflected as dark edges relative to the light minerals. They also show interference colors of third order and they are also usually uh, prismatic. Not always. Sometimes uh, certain crystals appear rounded, either by dissolution during uh, magmatic processes or erosion too. So now I will gather the certain crystals, and for that I will use the whiskers of a wild pig. So I have found the first zircon. Uh, now I will try to clean the surroundings a little bit, uh, just to have an open space so I can uh, easily identify the crystal later. As you can see, these crystals uh, show a high relief, so the, the edges look quite dark, and also show these pinkish, greenish colors, which is uh, typical of uh, third order interference colors and it's uh, also slightly prismatic or semi-prismatic in this case. So once we have uh, made the open space around these crystals, I will highly suggest to bring any other crystals that we find uh, next to this one. So we will start gathering all the crystals in this uh, empty area. What we see around these zircon crystals is glass. And this is because these are zircon stars from a volcanic rock. Okay, so now we have separated around 40 grains, zircon grains, and uh, we need to transfer them to a smaller petri dish where we have to dry them in order to later transfer them again to a double stick tape that we'll explain in detail later too. And, but now before we jump to that, I would like to show you on how identify also the silicons with the light coming from above and not from below the microscope. Okay, so yes, I will just turn off the bottom light and turn on the light coming from above. Okay, so you can see now that the can shine quite nicely and let me show you how the other grains look like too. So this is uh, probably glass, plagiar glass, we can see some biotides. So for me it's much uh, easier just to identify zircons with the light coming from the bottom of the microscope but it's up to you to decide which uh, light you prefer. So once we have the number of zircons we think it's, it's okay for our future analysis we can gather them very closely because we will extract them with the pipette. The idea is to extract them by sucking the, the minerals with the pipette 
And for that we need to be very careful of not having other minerals in the surroundings too, because then we will have a lot of contamination. So I highly suggest to clean all the surroundings and then proceeding to extract the minerals with the pipe. We'll see how now. Okay, so now we will extract the zircon grain from the petri dish with the pipette. So for that, keep very close to you the smaller petri dish because this is where we are transferring the sample. And in order to have a very efficient extraction of the zircons, try to hold the pipette very steady. You can do that by holding the pipette with one hand and using a finger to stabilize the pipe. Okay, so place the tip of the pipe very close to the grains, but before you introduce the tip of the pipe into the water, make sure that you already press the pipe in. If not, you will create a flow of air that will uh, move around all your grains. Now we can transfer them to the smaller petri dish. Okay, so now we can proceed to start creating the mount. For that we need an aluminum plate. We need a special tape. This is a double-sided sticky tape that is heat resistant. We need scissors. We need a cutter. And with a marker. So first step would be to cut the sticky tape. We just use the length that covers the entire aluminum plate. Once we have the sticky tape on the aluminum plate, we should be very careful, careful on not having bubbles in between the sticky tape and the aluminum plate. If there are any bubbles, we can use any type of card and we can try, try to just to take them out. It should be bubble free. Once the sample is bubble free, we need to mark small square. This is the place where we are going to put all the grains. Once we have done that, we can take the first cover of the sticky tape and we cut this area. Okay, so now we have a hole in the plastic cover of the sticky tape, so we can place it back. This way we can avoid having any minerals sticking in the surroundings of the mount. To transfer the silicon grains from the small petri dish to the sticky tape, we can use both. We can use the hair or whiskers and the metal needle. What we need to do is to add some grease into the whiskers or the metal needle. In this case I would use the whiskers and you can add grease just by 
rubbing the whiskers in your face or any place that you think it's good for that. Okay, once you've added some, some grease into the, the whiskers, you can carefully start picking the grains. They will uh, stick into the hair because of the grease. Then you just quickly change your field of view into the mount and you place the grain on the sticky tape You can arrange the grains with some small tweezers so you don't have to worry too much about how they are arranged right now so you can always take them and just make lines of grains or whatever shape you would like to try to press them a little bit into the sticky tape so they hold very well and don't fall in the future. Okay, so this is how it looks the mount once we have uh, mounted all the silicon grains from our separation. As you can see here we have two different groups of circons. In this case the bottom group is the circon from our sample or the unknowns and the circons from above are standards, so always remember to include the standards in this step of the process. In this case, because we are dating these circons, we are adding a circon that is well characterized for H, which is called AS3, it's from circon from a Duluth Gavro. And yeah, so this is how it looks, how it should look. Hope you can replicate this too. Okay, so now we can put the epoxy on our mount and in this case we will take it to our thin section lab, they will do it for us and a couple of days later we can have it back to proceed with the polishing. And that's the next step we will show you now. So now we got back the epoxy mount from the preparation laboratory, in this case this mount has been cut to the correct thickness for seams analysis which is between 4 and 5 millimeters and it's of course unpolished and we'll show you how to proceed with polishing. For that we need uh, different kinds of materials. We need a glass plate, we need a yes a white normal paper sheet, and we need a silicon carbide polishing paper we also need a diamond paste for polishing, in this case this is a 1 micrometer paste. We need some water and it's good always to have also some towels. In case that you're not using a new or brand new polishing paper, make sure that this is entirely clean so you can wash it in the sink and just to take out any potential contamination from coarser grains. We'll also use a microscope for the polishing. In this case, it's better to have a microscope that you have uh, reflected light and also transmitted light. Because we'll use both types of settings just to check the quality of the polishing. So here I am showing you an image from the microscope. In this case, we are using a reflected light. You can see the different grains. In this case, these are zircon grains. And we'll show you different images later on how they will look after the polishing. 
First, we use the silicone carbide polishing paper to polish our sample. And for that, we just need to add a bit of water. Notice that we're using the polishing paper on top of the glass plate. So we will add just a bit of water, not much. So before you start polishing your mount, make sure that it's entirely clean. So I would recommend to clean it up with uh, water and soap before uh, start the polishing because sometimes you can have some uh, coarser grains that can scratch all your sample. So now we can start with the polishing of the mount. For that we will do, uh, or we will follow eight patterns like this. So do something like this. And we do this because we want to have an even polishing of the mount. Otherwise, if you do just circles, you will have an uneven polishing of the grains. So we don't want that. So that's why we always use, or we always follow the infinite symbol or eight. After 15 or 20 seconds of polishing, I will look at the mount in the microscope. So here I'm showing you again an image from the microscope. And this time it's again reflected light. And what you can see here is that the grains are coming out from the epoxy. So you can see now that these white areas are showing in every different grain. It means that this is the exposed area of the grain now. If we change this, to, uh, this image to transmitted light, we can see the real size of the of the grains for example now you see the real size of the grains as you can see the exposed area is much smaller than the real size of the grain this means that we can keep going uh, we can keep polishing the the mount a bit more until we have the mid planes of the crystals which is what we want in we will know that the mid plane is rich when we see that the same size of the exposed area or the white areas in the reflected light are the same size of the grains in the transmitted light. After more polishing of the mount, we can see that the crystals are nicely exposed. And I think it's a good moment to change for a finer uh, sandpaper. The idea is to take out any potential scratches that we can still have on top of the grains or on the grains. So what we'll do now is we'll do a finer grain uh, paper size and try to uh, take out all these scratches like for example this one here and it doesn't matter that you don't take out the scratches from the epoxy mount this can stay but we want really to have clean surfaces on the silicon crystals. Now that we have the mid plane uh, of the crystals exposed in our epoxy mount we can now change to a finer sandpaper. In this case we are going to use a sandpaper with a grain size of 5 microns. But before we start polishing please remember to clean your sample with water and soap and also the glass plate. Just to avoid any contamination of coarser grains that can scratch your sample. So after polishing with the 5 micron grain size sandpaper we see that we still have some very fine scratches. We have uh, polished the deep scratches, but not really the very fine ones that were made also by the 5 micron grain sizes. So we'll try to take them out with uh, a finer diamond paste. In this case, it's a grain size of 1 microns. Just to have very clean surfaces. For the last step in the polishing uh, process, we'll use now diamond paste, 1 micron diamond paste, and a clean paper sheet. So for this we'll use only like half centimeter of the paste, not more than that. That should be fine. So we also polish with the same patterns following an 8 or an infinity symbol. Okay. 
So now the grains are entirely clean of scratches. You can see just a very nice and white surface. This means that the sample is ready to be cleaned. And one of the things you should notice is that sometimes the polishing paste makes some or leaves some marks, but this is not scratches, these are just part of the material that is still on top of the of the mount. So you can just wash it up with some soap and water and this, this will go on out. As we want to analyze this sample in the IOM probe, we have to follow certain cleaning steps. For the cleaning process we need three different types of liquids. The first one is EDTA, the second one is distilled water, and the third one is just methanol. We also will need an ultrasound base and plastic tweezers. We use the EDTA to clean any potential chemical contaminants in the surface of the mound. We use the still water to clean or to wash the EDTA that could be still on the mound. And we use the methanol to clean all the grease from fingerprints that could be also in the mound. As you can see, we don't need too much liquid. We just need enough to cover the entire mound just to avoid any waste of material. So the first step before we use any of these liquids is to wash the sample with tap water. Yes, to clean it from any remnants from the polishing process. So we can start with the EDTA. For that, we use the tweezers. We can shake the beaker with the sample a little bit and then we place it in the ultrasound base. This already has water inside and we'll just turn it on for around 15 to 20 seconds, not more than that. Okay. We transfer the sample now to the still water. Now we go to the last step of the cleaning process, which is the methanol. Before this step, we can dry the sample first using clean tissues. And we we'll give it. Okay. The sample now should be clean and ready to the next step. That would be coating of the sample with gold. Okay, so this is the final step. So we'll show you how to coat the sample with gold. In this case, we are using a quorum. Uh, coating machine. This machine is capable of not only coat samples with gold but also with um, carbon in case that you're interested to, to learn how to coat with this machine uh, for carbon please uh, maybe you can click the link in this video and we'll take you to the shorter video tutorial on how to coat the samples with carbon. So we have our sample clean here and before we place it into the sample stage, we should take care of two different things. One is to blow off any potential uh, dust from the sample, and for that we use this blower. Yes. Yeah. 
this should be fine. And the second part would be to check that the stage is at the highest level possible. So, in this case, you can just put it back like this. And that should be fine. Then we just place our sample and we put back the cylinder. So we make sure that it's okay and we can now just close the lid and proceed to the programming of the coating. In order to start the coating process, we go to this menu and we just click to display the different coating settings that this machine has. If you want to coat your sample for secondary iron mass spectrometry, we would need to use a gold coating that is 50 nanometers thick. So in this case, we select this specific setting and we just click on run profile. And then the machine will automatically do everything. So now the process has finished and the chamber is also vented. So now we can open the chamber carefully and we can just take out the cylinder and now you can see that the sample looks shiny as gold. So this means that this is ready and you can place it back into your box. Be sure to place back everything and turn out the machine once you're finished. So this was the heavy mineral separation process from a rock to mineral mount that we usually use in our institute and we hope that you find this video helpful.